kind of come up with a list of how victims feel whenever they've been in domestic violence situations, just because I work with a lot of um, people, particularly when they're in a domestic violence situation, it's difficult enough. But then when they're in a situation where they're getting um, unbiblical spiritual advice, that's actually calling them to be godly and go back into this environment. Um, one of the, there's a few things that I have written here. They say they feel confused because they think they know what the Bible says. Even like if I'm giving them godly counsel and they know it's godly mm-hmm. and I'm leading them to like Leslie Vernick or to your material. So they're hearing it from not just me. I'm like, this isn't just coming from me. Like this is biblical. Let me lead you to the, the best people in the field that I know. So they're getting this like material, but when they're faced with it, they feel confused. They feel like everyone is disappointed in them. In fact, they feel like an utter disappointment to God. And that breaks my heart the most. They feel suicidal. They're like, I feel so trapped. I would rather die. Hopeless, worthless, trapped. They feel like they're a failure to God and to others. They feel unforgiven. They doubt what I know is true. They begin to doubt everything. Um, and then I had somebody tell me recently, I feel like I can't think for myself. I'm just supposed to do what I'm told Mm. and doubt. So they doubt their salvation. And then, um, I've heard this many times. I have to do whatever any male in my church tells me, whether it's my spouse or a lay counselor, because that's this, like, you know, they use this male hierarchy. Like you're supposed to listen to us because we're the spiritual leaders. And I've actually come front to face to face with some of these male counselors who are misusing this information and they don't know what to do with me. They're they're like, I have never had a female confront me on my stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm like, I'm confronting you with God's word. Like I'm not confronting you. It's God who's actually confronting you. I've had people who were cussed at from a lay counselor saying, you need to stop being the victim and just go home. And I'm like, when's the last time you see Jesus using that tactic in the Bible? And they're like, never, but they are so, it's been so ingrained in them sometimes from a very early age that even when you begin giving them, like going back to your point on wisdom, when you begin giving them truth and wisdom, it can sometimes feel like you're, you're like, you know, on an uphill (laughs) incline, like almost feels like you're never good. Like you're, you're swimming upstream, right? And I'm like, I've, I know Leslie Vernick said, um, in one of the conferences I listened to, she said how she used an example with a girl that she's like, I'm trying to get the diesel off of you. You've been run over the diesels on you. I'm trying to lift it off and you keep putting it back on. Wow. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? And I've used that with people who, but ultimately they have to make the decision. Now, when you're in a situation where you have a child who's observing the domestic violence, this is where we can be gatekeepers and, you know, make a report. And then there's accountability. (laughs) I have seen accountability reports become, I've, they've always, something positive has always come out of them, even though I'm not popular when I have to make the report. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've seen parents go get counseling who never would have gone to get counseling. I've seen men completely turn their lives over to Jesus because they've had a CPS report made where the wife had to say either it's him or the kids, you get to make a decision. Right. So I think going back to your point where you're like, whenever we continue to enable the abuse continues, it's the verse you you know, the Bible in a way that I've never seen anybody know the Bible. And so like, after I've met you several times, I'll be like, I'm going to really, I don't memorize particular scriptures very well, but I have like an overall view. Um, and I've come to understand that's okay, but I'm sure you'll know right where I'm going, but there's the verse that says, what is in the darkness will continue to be dark and sin. But when it comes to the light, that's where healing can be found. Do you know what verse I'm talking about? (laughs) No, I don't right now, but, but I, I, I know the Bible says he will turn your darkness into light. In fact, that's our theme verse for, um, for, uh, hope in the night. In fact, the first time, the first year we were doing Hope in the Night, I I received a caller, uh, a 
we I was talking with a woman and she was from Houston and she um, said uh, what do I do if I have a husband who's abusive I said well, what do you mean by abuse because you know somebody can think well somebody just looks at you the wrong way that's abusive well, I just right she said well she said um my husband grabbed me by my hair pulled me down the stairs and then kicked and kicked and kicked I said that is abuse that is abuse that's absolutely abuse yeah and so in talking with her uh we were a brand new program and I said um have, have you been to your pastor long pause my husband is the pastor. I did not expect that. And then she said, I remember you telling that story somewhere along the way, maybe in your domestic violence conference two years ago. Yeah. And so then it's like, well, have you been, have you talked to like the chairman of the board of elders or deacons? Oh no, they're just his friends. And so I'm trying to think, Lord, put into my mind what I need to put in. You know, what, 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 what I need to say. I said, tell me, do you love your children? Oh, with my life. I said, what do you have? Who, you know, she have a son and a daughter. And uh, I said, so you, you're telling me you love your son with your life. Yes. So would it be okay if your son grew up to be like your husband? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no. I would never want that. Well, what about your daughter? Do you want your daughter to grow up just accepting abuse? No, no, never. I said, well, you're teaching your son if there's no intervention you're teaching your son, this is how husbands treat their wives so that when he becomes a husband one day, this is the likelihood of what he would do. Oh no, she said. I said, and your daughter, if all she sees is you accepting abuse, then she doesn't feel empowered to do anything else except accept abuse. Do you know that is what motivated her to action? She wouldn't do it for herself, but she loved her children with her life. And so she knew she had to take action. And sometimes when we're talking with someone, we have to realize they won't take action for themselves, but they would for the persons that they love the dearest, which could be their children. And the important thing is, I think we have a mindset of, oh, I just, I don't, I don't want him to be upset with me or whatever the language is. Wait a minute. Uh, what a person is doing who is committing domestic violence, this is against the word of God. It it's is the law, the heart of God. It's against the law of the land. Yeah. And it's against the law of God. Yeah. So how can God bless someone who is going against God's word and his will? In fact, sometimes you have to take intervention, take, take, take steps to intervene in order for that person to reach out and get help to change. And in the end, and you've already in intimated you you've experienced this in the end it is an act of of um, i'm going to use the word righteousness righteousness means what's right in god's sight and you know you say well do you want god's blessing on your family oh yes or do you want god's blessing on your life yes so when you want god's blessing you've got to be in the will of god if you're not in the will of God, you won't have the blessing of God. Well, what is the will of God? Well, part of his will is what he, he has communicated in his word. So if it's going against the word of God, then you're not in the will of God. 
then you won't have the blessing of God. So if you want your child, uh, if you want your family to be blessed by God, then we've got to line up our priorities. And since the Bible is absolutely clear against violence, uh, never is that right in God's sight. That's absolutely true. And I grew up with a lot of domestic violence in my family, and I'm the youngest of seven children. Oh. And two, my oldest two siblings have passed due to drugs, um, just hard living, drinking. Um, <clears throat> one died, I think, three years ago, and one died when I was 20. She was my oldest sister. And the rest are on meth, and they're pretty messed up, and they're in abusive situations. And I remember I was dating a guy um, just for a short time, but he, he punched me in the leg. He got mad at me and punched me in the leg. And at this point, I'm a Christian. And um, I just said very calmly, I need you to take me home because I don't want to upset him anymore. So he took me home and I said, this is the end. I will never, ever be in a situation where I will be hit again. And that was it. And I tell women, I'm like, look, we have more control than we realize. Mm -hmm. You feel powerless, but you actually have control and teaching them that they have control. And I've seen it. Like if you, if they hold their spouse accountable, there is a good chance. I've seen men mm -hmm. literally come to me begging for Jesus after their wife has finally stood up to them because now they're faced with, I'm going to lose what I really love. Right. But if they can have what they love and keep getting what they love out of the world, they're not going to change. But I guess I want to give hope to these people, to women or men who are living in this abuse and thinking that there's no hope. Um, there is hope, but it comes when we finally start to hold the boundaries that are given to us in scripture. And I found that verse that I was telling you about. It says, there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear and the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. And that's um, Luke 12, two and three. Like everything that is done in the dark will eventually make it to the light. And until it comes into the light, I always tell women, I'm like, I have women who come to me and they've not told a soul that they're being abused. And I'm like, until you bring this into the light, it will never go away. <laughs> it's our inability to feel confident in Christ and confident in ourselves and worthy enough. It's really a, a worthlessness, a sense of worthlessness that makes people stuck and keeps them in this place where they think that they don't deserve better. You know, you've hit something that um, before we started the program, you mentioned a particular scripture and I, I was so surprised because it was so significant to me. I needed it. I personally needed this scripture it's Galatians 1.10. And so often this is the mindset. I've got to have your approval. I've, I've just got, I, I, I have to have your, uh, I, I, I need you to be pleased with me. And, you know, and I'll do anything. Well, Galatians 1.10 says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I'm still trying to please people, I will not be the servant of Christ. Wow. It's like it's my life when I found that verse. <laughs> it was huge for me because I grew up where in a home, everybody had to do everything we could to please dad. And uh, he wasn't a safe person when he would have anger out of control. And so I, I grew up walking on the eggshells. I grew up being afraid. So I know what it's like to have to rethink. And that means, if, because you and I both have had that scripture impact us tremendously. It's like, am I now trying to win the approval of people? Or am I trying to please God? You know, if I'm still trying to please people, then I won't be the servant of Christ. So it, this is the way I say it. I do want people to like me, you know, 
we we want to be we want to be helpful and we want to be appreciated for what we do but the the truth is we must not live for the approval of people because there are going to be some people who will make it their aim not to be pleased with us and sometimes it's just plain stubbornness it it's like no i'm not going to let you know that you're right i'm not going to let you know that i'm pleased because that is i think of the seesaw you know uh, you get it on a seesaw and you go up and down and back and forth well as long as someone is not pleased with you they feel superior they they're they have this up position and they're looking down at you so instead a seesaw teeter tot is supposed to go back and forth and that's kind of you do this as children or can do it as, as adults but the fact is this seesaw business understand the one who has a critical spirit they are going to make sure that they stay criticizing you they're going to be fault finders well what do fault finders find the only thing they're looking for is fault so they're going to find fault and they feel superior then and so we have three inner needs for love, significance, and security. So love, significance, they get their need for significance met by feeling I am more important. I, what I say goes, this is, not, this is not the way of Christ. This is not the way we should be. And, you know, the Bible does say, about people and that we're, where we're in relationships, um, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. And so what we need to evaluate is at how much time are we giving people who are very unhealthy in their thinking? How much control are we giving them in regard to our minds and our attitudes and, you know, are, are we adopting a mindset that's not right in God's sight? Um, the, a similar parallel, parallel passage to the Luke passage you mentioned. Nothing in, in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So God knows when people are wrong toward us. God knows where where we we're wrong also, but the the key is not to just perpetuate to to perpetuate unhealthy relationships and unhealthy interactions. There are times when we need to say no to people so that we can say yes to God. That's a great point. Yeah, and I think it's always helped me to remember the scripture that says. Vengeance is mine, declareth the Lord. And I remember um, my stepdad, he was, I mean, he was a demon mm -hmm. and he drank all the time and he like would beat us. He would, um, we, there was never a safe moment. I don't remember ever feeling safe in my home. But when he passed, I remember this when my mom called me and told me that he had stage four lung cancer. I had been a Christian for a while and my immediate thought was that's what you get mm -hmm. for hurting me. And immediately God said, that's my child. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, he's not a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, and I remember being like, okay, God help me to love him because right now there's so much hurt. Mm -hmm. I pretty much lost my childhood because of this man. Um, well, my mom wasn't a jewel either, but things got really bad when he showed up. So fast forward, I start. I kept praying, like, God help me. You know, I didn't, my daughter was little at the time she had just been born. So I didn't go see him. I didn't want to see him. Um, but he was like dying. He was in the hospital and I ended up feeling God say, you need to go to him. That man was wrestling with demons. Like I've never seen. Wow. He was, I mean, ugh, ugh, like, and I could feel the, the, de the demons just like grasping him and he was struggling and he couldn't talk. He was so sick. And I just said his name. And I said, do you have peace? And he said, no, no. Like he didn't say anything coherent all day. But when I asked him if he had peace, he's like, no, no, no. 
then I was like, okay, um, thanks for letting me know. And I left. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't feel confident to lead somebody to the Lord yet. So I ended up leaving and I called a pastor and asked them to go and uh, meet with my stepdad. And he did, he accepted Christ, um, right before he, he passed away. Um, and I remember sh- I struggled with that and I felt bad about it. Cause I knew that that's God's plan. But I said to God, I said, why does this man who hurt me, who yeah. was so angry, get to go to the same place that I get to go to. And I'll never forget what God said to me. He said, Crystal, he lived his hell on earth. Wow. Living what people don't realize is living for themselves and doing what they think they want is actually creating their own misery. Mm. There's no joy in it. I never remember seeing him joyful or happy or content. It was always anger and frustration and um, alcohol, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was a profound point for me. And the same way with people who are abusing victims, they're not happy. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because they're broken. And the only way we're going to get them help is by holding them accountable. That's the only hope they have. I don't know about you, but I have never seen somebody just suddenly be like, I think I need to get help. Usually there has to be some intervention that comes head to head with them where they're suddenly like, okay, either there's some kind of legal (laughs) intervention. I've had women, um, I used to lead addictions groups and I'll never forget this, this young lady said, I was so angry with the person who reported me to CPS. Mm-hmm. And she, she was getting ready to graduate. She said, if I could find that person today, I would kiss them and hug them because they gave me my life back. Is that not powerful? <laughs> wow. wow. That's the value of watching and, and being able to admit, okay, I'm not where I need to be and I need help. And those who recognize they need help, that's wonderful but then they need to go to the kind of person who can give help. I do believe Christian counselors, uh, if they are wise Christian counselors, then there is an incredible amount of life-changing help. And that means sometimes you have to look at a particular topic since we talked about domestic violence to understand why do people get into this? Well, sometimes this is what you grew up with. You had harshness you're being treated a certain way and that becomes your norm and then you find out oh my normal isn't normal and i used to uh, you think i you know you don't know that you your normal isn't normal whatever you have is what you have but then when you go oh and, and just I, I think the key is ask god to give you this is a proverbs uh I'm trying to think it was 1320, I think. Proverbs 1320, he who walks with the wise grows wise. So if you need someone wise, pray. Say, God, please give me someone wise. I need, I need a wise friend. I need wise friends. I need a wise person who can give me counsel, uh, whether it's a one-on-one counseling opportunity, but somebody who has the wisdom from God. And then when you, like if it's, if it is in this area of spiritual abuse, if it is in the area of, of domestic violence, if it is in the area of anger, whatever, find out what does God really say about it? And you'll be empowered to not be a victim of if it's anger, somebody else's anger, or somebody else's spiritual abuse, or a victim of someone else's abusive treatment, you know, domestic violence, then then you find out, okay, then how do I not succumb? And then there's material that's available. And it's, I think it's incredibly valuable. And what I love about what you do, Crystal, is you're very specific. You don't just sit there and just say, well, just let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. And you twiddle your thumbs. And there, there are those counselors who just say, they, they, it's, 
kind of called a non-directive, you know, they don't direct the conversation and they just say, well, I'll just let them talk about whatever they want to talk about. Well, no, at times we need to listen to what God is saying in regard to that person and then reveal the truth. So I'm, I'm very grateful for your ministry, Crystal, because you're needed desperately in our world. Thank you. Well, I think it's just when you've tasted and see that the Lord is good, then there's no other, there's no other thing. There's, I, I literally get to do what I love. Some days are harder. There are times when we have a shutdown and um, education in terms of a course, we're, we're not going to be connecting because of the pain. In my sophomore year, um, I was beaten and uh, by my dad because I challenged him about his women, and uh, it was it, the conversation just went terribly south, neg negatively. And then the next day, I was sent off to boarding school. That year, at least for one quarter, I made all F's and one D, and um, I wasn't trying to not. I, I just, I, I couldn't connect, I, I, you know, and I didn't tell anybody anything. In fact, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago, my two sisters all of a sudden weren't doing well. And they asked me to be on a Zoom call uh, with a counselor, um, a coach, they said. And so the, so <laughs> there are the three of us and they said, okay, uh, June, why don't we begin with you? What was it like for you growing up? And I thought, I thought I'm here to help them. But anyway, so I start telling. And then I'm telling about being sent away to boarding school and making terrible grades. And and one of them said, I thought you wanted to be gone. I I just thought I didn't know it. You know, there are times when family, they have no idea of the accuracy of what really went on. And she began to cry, this sister. And she said, I didn't reach out to you. I, I was there on campus, you know, like four years younger. But she said, I, I, I just didn't know. So, you know, a lot of times people think, well, you know what we went through. No, you can be in the same family and you're treated differently. And you can be treated differently. Um, then they ended up saying, June, you were the lightning rod for dad. You know, he took everything out on you because you were trying to protect mom. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that they, in fact, they said, why, why didn't you tell us what was going on? And I thought, well, you were there. <laughs> but no, they, we, we must not. Expect. They were all in their survival mode. Yeah. And they, and you can be treated differently. You know, sometimes it's a gender. Sometimes a son is treated much better than a daughter. It's often mm -hmm. in that, that direction. But, you know, whatever it is, we need to be aware that God is the one who can heal the brokenhearted. It, the, the, I love that. Uh, he heals the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed Jesus in the spirit. spirit. Isn't that precious? And it's one of my favorite verses. It's gotten me through many, many tough times. You know, it's interesting that you say that because you know, my siblings, I think they really think that things just came easy for me because they've never sat down and said, how did you, you know, get through this? They just are angry with me because I've made something out of my life. I've never judged them. I've never, I don't even really talk to them. My sister that sent me a mean message. I'm like, I've been out of the picture since I was 16. How could I possibly be making your life this terrible? Right. <laughs> but they're so full of like, they need Jesus so much. And, um, but I was thinking about like, nobody knows what we went through to get to this process of healing. Nobody knows that I was suicidal for two years when I was in high school and literally hurt so bad that I wanted to die. That's why when somebody comes to me who's suicidal, that's one of the areas I specialize with. A lot of counselors won't take somebody who's suicidal. Mm -hmm. They're scared. There's a high risk, right? But oh, if you can I, have been I, in that I situation, that. I tell, I, in fact, I was, with a, a 14 year old the other day and she was suicidal. I said, exactly, I remember being suicidal. 
I remember I had a driver's license and I was at Mockingbird Lane and Central Expressway. And I thought, press the pedal. I was the first car, press the pedal, press the pedal, like just go over and it'll be over because I couldn't see anything would change. And see, that's part of the problem. People who are suicidal, they don't have hope. They've lost, lost hope that things will ever change. And I thought that that's never going to change. And so I just kept thinking, press the pedal, press the pedal, press the pedal. And, and I was trying to talk myself into just floorboarding it and then go going over the overpass. But I'm math oriented. I'm logical. What if I don't die? What if I become maimed? I thought, oh, no, no. Then I'll be a burden. I can't. No, I can't. I can't run that risk because I didn't want to burden my mom. I'm wanting to save my mom, but I, right. and so, so, but I, um, I could not see any future, but you know, one thing that I told this 14 year old, I said, are you aware the brain doesn't even fully mature until age 25, to 25, yeah. 28. It's but, but, but so it can be 28. So I said, honey, you have all the hope in the world because the God of hope is the one who has his plan for you. And it's imperative that you understand, yes, things are horrible right now. Yes, things are tough. But right now, God, already, he says, I know the plans I have for you. He's already figured out the plan specialized for you, but you don't have to know the plan. And that's, that's good because you won't know the plan. He's already got the plan in place. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Anyone who is suicidal, I always give them that scripture. And I let them know you won't know the plan because he's got it pre-planned. But you need to say, I'm willing to hang on to hope. And yeah, that's willing. why I love your practice, the name. And that's what you always say, like, hang on to hope. I love that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just need to let them borrow our hope because they don't have hope. So I had this girl that come in. I'm like, okay, 25 minutes. So I started asking her a question. And I said, have you ever attempted suicide? And she looked at me with such a, like a confidence in her eye. Like I could see she wanted to die. And she said, yes. And she pulled up her arm and showed me all of these huge scars. And I just put everything down and I scooted up my chair and I looked at her and I said, this was God. He was just kind of, I was new. I was just out of school. <laughs> this is my first job. And I looked at her and I said, do you really want to die? Do you know what that means? And I'll never forget what this girl said. She said, yes, because it's a cruel world and I don't want to be here. Mm. And I'm like, what do I do with that? Because it is a cruel world. <laughs> I've been at the receiving end. This, this girl's been through some stuff. And I looked at her and I don't usually show pictures of my family. Um, but I said, you know what? My world was pretty cruel one time. And I said, and when it was really cruel, if I would have taken my life then. And I couldn't use God because it was not a Christian center. Yep. I said, if I would have taken my life when my life was most cruel. I wouldn't have the promise and the blessings that I have in my life right now, a loving husband and four amazing, beautiful children. And I showed her the picture and I said, maybe what you have to live for right now, isn't what you're enduring now, but it's for something that God, like, I couldn't even tell her that I'm like something that is in the future that you can't even see yet. I remember like the first time this, this girl just broke down crying. Wow. But just giving them that hope of the future. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's so important that we're talking about domestic violence. Because when people are stuck in a domestic violence situation, they're hopeless. I remember I was a little girl and I don't know how old I was, maybe eight. And I was hearing people just scream. And I went into my closet and I remember my mom was, she would sometimes like talk about like, you know, like I'm going to pray. She was kind of like charismatic -y sometimes, but nothing ever changed the way she acted. And so I remember she said something about, if you're going to pray, you're going to pray in your closet. And so I went into the closet and I just poured my heart out 
and I didn't even like, I knew about a little bit about God, but I didn't know much. And I said, God, please give me a family that loves me, please. Like, I can't handle this. And I just cried. What I didn't realize was that God didn't give me that family right away. Mm -hmm. But today I have four amazing kids. I have an amazing husband. And I just bought a sign like a year ago that said, I still remember the day that I prayed for everything I have now. And my husband came home and saw it. He goes, you bought another picture. He was kind of like, take it down. He's like, everything's so cluttered. And I said, wait, let me tell you why I bought that picture. I remember him going, okay. (laughs) But yeah, it's like, I think we think God doesn't hear us sometimes, but he does. And he heard me as a little girl. Say say the name of the, say say what was on the picture again. The picture? Uh I still remember the day that I prayed for everything I have today. That is so Isn't good. that beautiful? That's wonderful. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember praying as a little girl that I would have a family. And what's so cool is that God desires to give us everything, but he, not everything, but like all the desires of our hearts that's in his will. Like, I don't want a Ferrari. And if I did, I don't think he would give it to me <laughs> because <laughs> that's not in God's will. Yeah. But a loving family is in what God desires for all of us this is what he desires. I think some of us think that this is just our, you know, our cross to bear. (laughs) And, um, but God does desire to give us these things. Um, so I think like an ending, I want to just kind of recap that for people who are struggling with, if you're in a situation where you're in domestic violence, the first step is you have to accept Christ. And you so lovingly shared the gospel message early on in the program that if we, we believe that God is God and we believe that he, that Christ died for our sins and he was risen from the dead for our redemption. And he did this out of love and it's a gift. It's not something we have to earn. And we ask God to forgive us, forgive us of our sins. And we surrender our lives to him. Every bit of it, our desires, our future, right? Then we shall be saved. I remember a pastor said to me, or it wasn't to me, it was in the sermon and it was many years ago. And he said, everyone wants to know that there's a Lord, but very few want him to be Lord of their life. Mm. And I'm like, it stuck with me for a long time. And so, um, surrender to Jesus and then begin, like you said, seek wisdom. We have to seek wisdom. We have to find somebody who's wise, who has Christian counsel. That's not going to spiritually abuse us, but lead us to the truth of the scripture. And then begin to step out, not in your strength, but in God's strength yes. to help us, to be, empower us, to get to a place. If we're in a domestic violence situation, if I would have stayed in my childhood town, I don't even want to think about what would happen to me. You've always said, it's like the Bible says we are to leave and cleave, leave. <laughs> right? <laughs> if I wouldn't have left, I would, I would still be caught up in this spiral that I couldn't stop. If I could, I would. And for years I tried and have no control over saving somebody. I'm a counselor and I have no control. The only one who has control is God and the person. They choose whether they're going to take the wisdom and use it or if they're going to remain stuck. But I can't be all upset if they don't do what I want them to do because it's not about me. <laughs> it's about God. It's about them finding God. So that's like kind of a recap. Any final thoughts from you? One thing that I think if, if we're talking about domestic violence, so often there is a, it's called a codependent relationship. It's like, but I need to be his all in all. I need to be whatever he needs me to be. And it feels very sacrificial very honoring look i'm i'm doing what's honoring but with codependency what that means is basically those who are codependent the word co means with and so you're with someone who actually has a wrong dependence if they're 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 unhealthy in their lifestyle and so instead of supporting that which they don't, they need to change, but 
Instead, we need to be the ones to change. And that means instead of being codependent, uh, and that means I'm literally uh, addicted to that relationship. It's a relationship addiction. And instead it's saying, I'm now going to end up, I want to be the person you created me to be, Lord. And this is not a healthy relationship. And there has to be something that changes. And that means I've got to be the one to change. And you can even say, I, I ask your forgiveness at times I've tried to um, be extra pleasing or I've, I've had wrong priorities. And so I just ask you to forgive me. And then you turn around now and you're going to prioritize being the person God created you to be. And that means at times saying no to a person so that you can say yes to God. Mm -hmm. And then the dynamic can change and you will be so grateful for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so June, you are a blessing to me and you are, are a blessing to so many. And um, I think that being in the ministry, I know can be really draining. And I know that the only way we can do it well is in God's strength. If I don't start out my day in prayer and with the devotion, I always feel it. <laughs> I don't do as well as I like, don't feel as strong necessarily when I'm in um, when I'm faced with the stuff of the world or difficult clients. Um, but I remember one day I was going to end with this scripture is one, one particular day I, I saw like 11 people in a day. And this was several years ago and I had a long drive home and it was dark. It was like 10 o'clock and I was drained and I was tired. And I heard so many like heart wrenching things that day. And I just was like praying and I'm like, God, how do you do this? Like I have, you know, I listened to 10 people today or 11 and my heart is just so like weary. Like, how do you do this with every single person in the entire world? And so I just kind of listened to some worship music. It was in a state of prayer. And then I pulled into my driveway, which is a really long, it was, we moved, but it was a fourth of a mile long. And I sat at the end and I was like, I typed in scriptures for the, for, for ministry, people in the ministry who are weary and God led me to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. Mm. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance." And so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the people. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord, for my soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Mm -hmm. And that's become my theme voice and are not it's my theme verse. 
And what God said to me, as I sat there reading this with tears, just like coming down my face, he's like, you're not doing this in your own power. I've anointed you with the gift Mm. and you don't have to save them. You just have to love them. Can you just love the people I send to you? Mm. I remember just like, I took a deep breath. I'm like, yes, I can love them. That's what I do well, Yes, but I can't save them. (laughs) And so um, only one savior and you are not him. (laughs) Exactly. But But sometimes I can easily move into that, right? (laughs) Right. And so that really gave me freedom. And I also think it really stands up against all these arguments that we're called to live in an abusive situation. If you read through this, you see very clearly that that's not God's plan. He wants people, he wants us as ministers to help lead people to a place where they're free, not to push them into a shame position where they remain stuck, but a place where they can find freedom and joy. The Bible says that Jesus came so that we can have abundant life. An abundant life isn't remaining in an abusive environment. No. So thank you for sharing today. It was a blessing to me. And I know anybody who listens to this podcast, I'll also upload it on YouTube. Um, So it will be there for lots of people to see. I will share with you the link. I'll send it to your website. Um, How would you feel about closing us, closing and praying for anybody who needs wisdom, Jesus, and help if they're in a domestic violence situation. I'm honored to do that. Thank Heavenly you. Father, thank you that you have given great wisdom to Crystal. Thank you that you impart your truths to us freely if we will just listen and apply what you have presented to us. And uh, right now for the one who is struggling not knowing what to do because of a very difficult relationship. Thank you that you've already communicated in your holy word that there are times when we do need to evaluate our priorities and not live for the approval of someone else because many times, no matter how much we try, we will not have approval because that's the leverage that that person has over us. Lord, I pray for the one who knows that something needs to change. Thank you that you're the change agent and that sometimes that change begins with us where the relationship has to be yielded to you and we don't prioritize another person or else we are literally uh, prioritizing a person over you, Lord Jesus. And so instead, I just pray that you will take these truths that are presented in this time together that we've had and uh, empower those who need to hear from you based on your word that has been spoken. Uh, We pray that there would be lasting change I pray that there will be uh, an uneasiness if things need to change. I pray that we would have an uneasiness, uh, a lack of peace, because what you've told us is we are given a peace that passes all understanding through um, your Holy Spirit who gives us his peace. But if we're not in the right relationship if we're not in line with what is right in your sight, then we will have a lack of peace. And may that be the impetus to instead say, all right, Lord, I'm willing to change. Instead of me just putting up with what's wrong or just uh, being a victim, um, I have a choice. I, I can do what you say in your word. And that is, not accept that which is abusive uh, to not associate at times with those who are easily angered, that we have a choice to set a boundary to say no to people so that we can say yes to you, Lord. Thank you for truth that sets us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, June.
It was a blessing. Thank you, Crystal. It was a joy. I'm going to end.